So we will have Emma Cooker from Bloomberg that, uh, that is helping us uh, get this session off the ground. She will moderate that in her professional way. I know that from the past. We will have Enrique Villamidiana from Panasonic, Jose de la Loja from Train, and Kalis Goldstein from the Commission should be with us remotely, and he is ready. I can see him here. He's not on the, on the screen. Um, you may think that this is a bit... Yeah, confusing, or not, not, it's not confusing, but that this combination of speakers uh, could, could be surprising, but I think you will learn a lot about what large heat pumps can do in cities, and we hope that Carlos can give us an insight on the, um, on the recognition thereof by the European Commission. But where do I have Emma? Exactly, where are my speakers? <laughs> 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 So, we really have to say thank you for Bloomberg, for, to Bloomberg for sending us uh, three space. people we had in the, uh, we had also yesterday Meredith Annex with us uh, presenting the new adoption rate curves and adoption rate analysis by Bloomberg and now I hand over to you, Emma, you, but you are mic'd yeah, already, I I'm think. already so mic'd, although ahead. I don't have a clicker is the only thing. Um, there is a clicker and I will get it to you. Ah, the clicker is coming. Sorry, we were just talking backstage, feet. clearly far too long. Thank you so much. So, the floor is yours. Um, I won't go through what Bloomberg New Energy Finance does. Emma did a great job of that. But effectively, I sit in our heating and cooling team, and I specialize in uh, buildings and industry. So, what I'm going to tell you about um, is how we treat heating and cooling uh, at Bloomberg New Energy Finance. And that's in part because today, in our panel discussion, we're going to be talking about cities. And for cities, heating is incredibly important. And that's in large part because of the big, as a significant part of emissions for it. Emissions from, for cities, uh, you know, if we're talking scope one and scope two, which is fuel use um, on site and power use, as well as embedded emissions, you know, a significant amount of that is energy use, and is in particular energy use in homes. And so for our discussion today, I might as well almost kick off the panel discussion because we're going to talk about, you know, what are the front running technologies? What are some of the digitalization solutions to build on Emma's panel that's just gone? Um, and then finally, what are some of our barriers? So just in short summary, as I know, you know, the audience knows this. At Bloomberg New Energy Finance, we see the kind of key solutions for buildings being three main pathways in terms of fuel switching. That is electrification, clearly the focus of today. We focus mainly on heat pumps. Um, direct electric, obviously also a solution, but slightly less efficient. Um, we then also look at district heating. District heating slightly different because we're talking about the grid, which in fact can have you know, multiple sources, but in which case then we're talking largely about uh, industrial scale heat pumps or waste heat as opportunities. And then finally, we've got green gases. Now, green gases encompasses a lot. It encompasses bioenergy, so we're talking about biogas, biomethane, or direct consumption of uh, combustion of biomass. Um, or we're talking about hydrogen and synthetic gases. Now, one of those is hard to scale sustainably, and one of those is less commercially viable today. And I can obviously let you guess which one we think is that. The other side of the pathway, alongside fuel switching, is energy efficiency. And Dan kind of covered that this morning. It's going to play a significant role, but it's not the front runner, right? We need it. It's definitely part of the equation, but it's not the whole equation. And so with that, I'll invite the panelists up on stage. I think they're still chatting. So Enrique and Jose, please come up. So Enrique is the managing director from Panasonic uh, Europe, and we've got Jose from Train, who is the president in EMEA. And then last but not least, Virtually, we're joined by Carlos, who is a energy efficiency advisor for the European Commission. So first, I'm going to go to Jose as soon as he sits down. Oh. Okay. So okay. I just quickly summarized that electrification was kind of the key pathway, and we've discussed that a lot today. Um, I want to see, you know, how is that playing out for train, and, and how are you seeing that kind of unfold? Okay, well, for me, this electrification story is really a once-in-a-generation event. So I've worked in a train for 27 years. I've done my whole career there. And when I started a train, we were really, you know, we're focused on the commercial building space. 
and we were making chillers that make cold water. So we make cold water, and that cold water can be used either for comfort cooling or you know, industrial processes, that sort of thing. And you know, we call a lot on mechanical contractors, we call a lot on designers and, uh, and building owners, that sort of thing. But really, the market was, it was very siloed. You have cooling plants and you have a heating plant. And those heating plants have, were, you know, until very recently, until like say five, six years ago, I wasn't even thinking about the heating plants. It's, it's like a fossil fuel plant, and I've, I've learned a lot about how those heating plants work over the last five years, just as a, so let's say, an intellectual type curiosity. But it's incredible that, build, that we created these silos, and I guess it's technological in uh, the, the reasons are technological, but the technology has evolved so much over the last five years that now, today, we're at the point where you can combine these heating and cooling plants into one plant. And uh, when you do that, the energy efficiency improvements are, are really Im impressive, right? We can move, you, we, we do combine heating and cooling plants now where they're 400% plus more efficient than before. And there's no direct fossil fuel use on the, uh, on the site. And as well, as you think about e electrical grids greening, into the future, something that was always considered a problem, let's say from an environmental point of view, the heating and cooling of buildings, becomes really a true net zero thing because the electricity is produced from zero emissions and that electricity is used to run this combined cooling and heating plant. So my biggest challenge in this journey of electrifying heating and cooling and combining cooling and heating plants is really awareness, okay? Because you know, we have 1,000 salespeople and we're out there, you know, trying to tell these stories. We've developed the technology to do all this and, you know, and, but, and we, we don't want to go too much into that today. But the awareness, when I say awareness, I mean, if I grab, you know, and I think in this room it's an easy crowd, right, to sell this thing to. So I've sold, it, it's, I'm always selling, but I've had much tougher crowds. But uh, if I were to go outside and get 20 people off the street there and ask them, you know, what do you think about electrification? They're going to talk, I'm sure, about moving from internal combustion engine cars to electric cars and how that's great for the climate and great for the pollution in the city. But it's, I'd be surprised if one of those people said to me, do you know that every building around us has chimneys that we don't see because architecturally they're hidden and they're emitting exactly the same thing that the car is emitting and we can combine that heating and cooling in those buildings and get rid of that and have the same impact on the city than the electric car and, and nobody knows that, right? So if we could make it, bring that level of energy that we see in the electric car industry to combining heating and cooling plants, this thing would take off. It, not that it's not already taking off, like in the last, in 2021, 30% of our revenues are going to come from uh, combined heating and cooling plants. Like five years ago, it was zero. So it's, it's, it's really the fastest part of growth of our business. And I think, it's, I think it's the future, and there's no way we're going to stop this, right? And there are then other things you can lay on, layer onto it, but I can talk all day about this, so I'll, I'll let you <laughs> yeah, ask I mean, the next I'll, I'll question. Jump in there. <laughs> I do want to talk about market segments for sure. I mean, you hope the audience knows what a heat pump is. Otherwise, yeah, you're in for a bit of a shock today. But um, I'm going to jump to Carlos for this. How do we balance that awareness we're talking about for electrification and, and picking a front-runner technology with the need to have technology agnostic policy or, or for governments to have technology agnostic policy? Well, thanks very much, very much. Uh, and, uh, and uh, hello, hello to everyone. everyone. I mean, uh, you've heard already some angles and ideas from the best in academia, policy, industry, and some of my best colleagues. So, um, there will be limits to what I can add to the discussion before you head off to the award ceremony and the wonderful dinner and reception. But let me bring you a positive message. The idea here is that the Commission is and has always been uh, about promoting excellence. So this is in fact already embedded in regulation on energy efficiency, renewable energy and uh, energy market design, not to mention eco-design and the F-gas regulation. Uh, plus, uh, there are additional um, liberties to design measures uh, at other uh, administrative levels, for example, national, local, district. And of course, uh, Jose very kindly uh, mentioned or brought this in is the individual. So awareness and people can make uh, better choices. 
Uh, the thing is that choices need to be presented to them. Uh, fortunately, in most cases, in most buildings, they already have an electrical connection. So electrification per se is technically easier than maybe using another type of energy carrier. Um, but I think that the, the main question here is how to overcome uh, the exclusiveness or the luxury aspect of the technology. So what I mean by this, let's maybe use the example of electric mobility, as Jose did very conveniently. Who do you see driving Teslas? I mean, these are usually the people who are well aware. Uh, they have a steady income. Um, so people watch in awe as they drive by uh, silently. And uh, that's the same image that we have uh, for heating, basically. Uh, that uh, if you have solar PV on the roof, then somehow you're privileged. Um, of course, we have took, taken these baby steps uh, with early movers to get to a certain market penetration. But definitely in the coming years, what has to happen is that uh, the technologies will need to become more affordable, more accessible and more widely used. My thesis is going to be that the technologies already exist. They can be always tinkered and improved. And I'm really happy to hear that we're making efficiency improvements across the board. Uh, and this is really important. But at the same time, we also have to make sure that the technology spreads and reaches the consumers. Um, if we look at the broader scope and contextualize, then, I mean, the aspect of urgency of climate change is really, really evident. And if we sort of contrast it or put it in the context of uh, the building sector, it is the prime example to decarbonize because, first of all, it's really stable. That's why people call it real estate. I mean, it's, it's there for decades. And uh, once you make the right choices in terms of the energy mix, um, you're pretty well set um, and you can pass it on to the next generation. And that's why uh, we're looking at uh, the social aspects of, uh, of uh, the transition really, really closely to make it again acceptable and desirable to switch uh, technologies towards the more renewable options. Um, but there need to be enablers as well. And I would like to bring in the systems angle. The energy sector has decarbonized and will continue to decarbonize. But it needs to trickle down and the renewable energy actually has to be used, uh, not just produced and possibly curtailed in some cases. So this is why the efficient technologies uh, coupled with storage, hybrid solutions and uh, the flexibility that buildings can offer are a prime target for EU policy uh, and also I understand that business is really interested in it. But I agree, it's very much that divide where you know we're seeing the early adopters and in part that has to do with wealth as well. On that system level perspective and management of the system, Enrique, I'd like to bring you in. In terms of digitalization, I know you worked on the smart city quarter in Berlin. You know, are these, can we take the decision away from consumers and just make it an easy choice for them? Well, thank, thank you very much. In fact, I, I can connect the what Jose said and also what Carly said, because in fact, I think one of the one of the big issues we need to overcome is most of the population is in fact living in those areas, so very populated areas, uh, cities. And in fact, that is the challenge we have to, to face in the next year. So we need to bring decarbonization, we need to bring heating, we need to bring, I have to say on top of what you said, heating, cooling. In fact, we need to connect uh, solar panels, we need to connect batteries. So we need to go beyond the standard systems we have. We are now connecting, we put in together. So in fact, in, in in a smart city, Berlin, in a smart city, in this is smart city in this quarter, uh, Panasonic has been integrating uh, not only the heating, not only the, the cooling, but also solar panel management of batteries. So we have been trying to integrate all together, and in fact, uh, it's a it's a project where, uh, and I think I come to what you say, Carlis, is is not only about uh, supplying to the ones who are having a Tesla. So in fact, this, this project is a project which is inclusive, which is social. So in fact, uh, that one of the targets was to bring the technology, to bring the, those efficiencies to people that normally 
would not have those technologies available. So that, that is the, the project. And in fact, we are uh, having a target by using uh, digitalization, by using uh, connectivity. We are having a target to bring to those people not, not only the, the standard concept of flexibility or comfort, but also we are expecting they will get uh, much affordable prices, up to maybe 15 percent uh, better, better cost that they would normally uh, have. And in fact, this is only one side of the, of the project. So if we look at the other side, it's not only about managing the heating. So I think we need to look at the full aspect of uh, the, the project. So we are also considering how we will, on top of that, how we will manage the systems, how we will remotely support them to improve uh, repairs, how to improve still even more the efficiency of the systems in a way that we can even uh, reduce the CO2 impact uh, furthermore. So I think it's, we can connect the two concepts you have been uh, mentioning before. Yeah, thank you, Enrique. I think oh, we're being a little bit interrupted, <laughs> but hopefully you can still hear us. So, it's an interesting one, right? Because we talk about on the one end, we've got the early adopters and those who are willing to, you know, yeah, buy the Tesla, drive the Tesla, you know, be known for it. And then on the other side, where we see policy kind of moving, especially for the Fit for 55, for instance, um, socially owned housing or public sector buildings are kind of also a very big target. So, Carlos, I'd like to come back to you. How does it help? You know, are they easy first movers? You know, does that get us to mass deployment and kind of cost declines by targeting that kind of sector? Okay. So can I ask? The, the different, different sectors, sectors will need to, to go, go hand, hand, in hand. hand in hand. There will always, there will always be those, be those who, are who are to pick up, pick up on innovation, innovation and, uh, and uh, has uh, always been, been like this. Like this. We need them because, because they demonstrate to the rest of the society, society what is possible and often they show their own the initial, initial cost of developing it, developing it or bringing, or bringing it into the market. market. They also, they also risk, risk uh, suffering the bigger losses, losses usually because, because uh, in case there's no business case, no business case then, they then they will have will paid, have paid but, there's but there's no after sales, after sales or the, or the model, model just eases to exist. To exist. And, and that's what is the, the let's say, let's say, cost for the early adopters. At the same, At the same time, time, I think that, I think that we, we uh, as I said, as in, said the in the first part, part we are already, we are already um, beyond, the beyond the point of, point of uh, proving the technology. The technologies, the technologies are already, already out there. there. So now so what now we need, we need is, is to, to, at least, at least from, from a European perspective, perspective, try to make try progress to make in the areas, areas where, where, uh, most, uh, where we can where take we can the take longest steps, so where we can advance the fastest. And, and oh, oh, this brings, this brings in, in the, the, the social, social sector, sector, but not but just, not just the worst performing, performing buildings. buildings. So, so the buildings, the buildings that, that are um, in, in a uh, really, really bad state, state of uh, repair, repair uh, those, uh, those who waste, who waste a lot of energy, energy due to people's ignorance, ignorance or, because or because they, they don't, don't make the right, the right choices. choices. It's not, it's necessarily, not necessarily the people, the people who are worse off, off, but it's just, it's just the, the, the situation of uh, the, building the building that they, that they have, have uh, let themselves, let themselves uh, to be found, to be found, in. found in. So, so um, um, all, buildings all buildings are important. Are important. But the, uh, in order to in order increase, increase the scale, the scale uh, uh, we have to we look have to at, look at uh, uh, what is out there today, gradually build up the project pipelines, uh, look, uh, look at, at what resources, what resources are, available are available and match it together, together with the pace, with the pace of, of uh, evolution. evolution. And this is and the point that point the industry is making, making, that if, that if we have a really ambitious, ambitious target, target, then, then the, industry the industry will also need to scale, scale up to scale match, up, uh, meet that, that uh, demand. demand. So, so the market, the market will have to have develop, to develop uh, uh, but also, but also the, the finances and uh, people's own people's perception, perception will have to, have to match, match uh, together. together. It, all, it all, you could say, starts start with, with the policy the ambition, policy ambition. Um, um, but if, but there's, if, there's, uh, if the, the ecosystem, ecosystem doesn't support, doesn't support it, 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 it risks, risks simply falling, falling flat. flat. So, uh, so uh, right uh, now, right now in, in, on the European level, we're making available various channels of funding. Uh, uh, technical, technical assistance, assistance uh, guidance, uh, guidance, and for the, the revision of the performance, performance of buildings directly later, later on this, this year, year, we're also going to look at uh, renovation uh, targets, targets, which, which should, should uh, upgrade uh, the, the buildings uh, across uh, the EU to, uh, to a much, much higher, higher energy performance, energy performance level. level. Perfect. So from a policy perspective too, back to you, Enrique, on, from Panasonic's perspective, what are the first movers? You know, where commercially are we seeing it? At, at Benny, if we obviously, and I'm sure this crowd knows well, you know, new build markets are 
are ripe for low carbon technologies and in part because of minimum energy performance standards and in part because they're cheaper. You know, in Germany, for instance, you know, we're seeing kind of upward 40% new builds adopting heat pumps. Do you agree? Is it new builds? Are there other parts of the market that um, are moving naturally without that push? Europe, there are many Europe's. So, and we can see a, a lot of speeds uh, of how the market is moving. And yeah, I think uh, you, could, you could see countries where the new and retrofit markets are moving very fast. So you see markets where only new building is moving. You see markets where nothing is moving. But uh, I think it's very important that we all understand that there are different motivations to move. So it's not the same, the motivation that a consumer can have. So let's say subsidies, regulatory uh, frame, that is very important to set it up correctly. We move to commercial. So commercial sometimes is moved by CO2 footprint, by the policy they have declared to the uh, shareholders just, uh, just uh, before. So we need to really consider those. And we have cases, for instance, we believe retrofit is already happening. So, and we have many examples where a type of a small, if we come to the district heating, a small district heating, and I'm a believer that district heating has uh, many concepts. So it could be very big machines, or it could be uh, one small building where we are having district heating for the, for the 16 flats, for instance. But I think the, to move this market, we need, uh, we need definitely, in our opinion, is first, we need to move from setting a target of uh, renewable energy in the buildings to maybe move the target to how much renewable heating in that building. Yeah? So I think that is a, an important point. And the second point would be that we cannot consider that there is one solution that fits for all. So there are many solutions and we need to use them in the, in the proper manner. Okay. Jose, do you agree? Is, are you seeing similar markets or yeah? No, I agree 100% with what's been said here. And I think also that it is happening. It just and it is accelerating, and we have to continue to to sell that. And you know, sometimes the legislation may be a little bit uh, too complex, and uh, we may need to simplify it a bit. Like, for example, again, I always link back to the automotive sector. But if you think about emissions ratings on vehicles, right? They need to meet a certain level of emissions, and and we have that for boilers as well. But if you you know, one of the things I always dreamed about, I used to talk at another association about that, you know, there is so much heat being rejected from buildings. Every building is rejecting heat, but there is no legislation at all. You can, you can reject all the heat you want into the atmosphere and no one is even measuring that or legislating against that. And rejecting heat is just rejecting energy. So maybe we need to look at things at a little bit higher level and say, okay, we should treat rejecting heat just like we treat rejecting emissions and maybe somehow tax it or something, and that will drive people into you know, more of this idea of combining heating and cooling. Yeah, perfect. Carlos, I'd like to come back to you on, on, on almost both of those points. So they were kind of specific to policy mechanisms we could use. So has you know, the European Commission considered things around wasted energy or, or reuse of, um, yeah, exactly, rejected energy today? Um, that kind of plays towards energy efficiency, right? And Enrique's point on, do we need to be more specific in terms of targets for heating, where the words are more tailored to heating specific rather than buildings or the, or the system level? First on wasted energy, energy, that's already, that's already at the core of the energy, energy efficiency, efficiency directive. directive. And also, and also in, the in the renewable energy, energy directive, directive, you, you can, can count, count the, the use of the wasted energy, energy as a renewable, as a renewable energy. energy. What this, what means, this means is that if you manage to capture uh, energy, energy, then, then uh, that you that can account together with your renewables. And that is a great thing because the ambition level of the European policy is increasing. Again, again uh, by, by 2030. 2030. So, so it definitely, definitely has, has a place, place on its own. Its own.
Now about now specific, specific targets, targets uh, uh, for, for heating, heating and heat use, use. Um, um, we're already, already looking at uh, the uh, renewable energy, energy delivered, delivered to, to uh, uh, the final customers. Final customers. And, and if you couple that with, with the point I raised before, before well, well, waste, waste energy, energy. Uh, there, you uh, there you have a certain have model, model that, that uh, helps waste energy, energy capture and reuse, and reuse uh, find uh, its place. The question there, I think, is more of matching up the physical infrastructure, infrastructure and, planning. and planning, because, because uh, even, even though, though uh, the, technology the technology might exist, might exist the, heat the heat or cold, or cold source might source exist, might exist. Uh, you, uh, need, you to need to plan, you need to link, link up uh, different, uh, different consumers, consumers and providers, and, providers. and, and um, this, this requires, requires certain, certain agreements, agreements and levels, and levels of, of trust, trust that uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes need, uh, need uh, uh, either, uh, either documenting, documenting or a level of legislation to support. How this, How is, this done, is done, I mean, I each handshake, handshake cannot be cannot regulated on an EU level, level. So, there's so there's definitely, definitely an, individual an individual component, component to, that. to that. Yeah, we at BNEF have been looking exactly at that, at waste energy and how you can effectively ensure a contractual offtake for a certain amount of time. When, when we're talking about district heat, right, you want a secured contract, but then how do you negotiate the price for that? I'm wondering, does that come into considerations for, you know, for heat pumps that are fueled by waste heat for, say, train? Jose, if I bring you in, does it, is that factor in? Or, or are you more talking about use within one industrial site so they're just reusing their own, own waste energy? Well, I think the, the, you know, the fact that we classify heat pumps and waste heat as a renewable energy source is, is a fantastic thing. I don't think it's well understood in industry so much that it, it you know, usually people associate renewable uh, energy with, you know, windmills and, and PV panels, right? But uh, I think it's, it's good that that's happening. And it does factor into a lot of the projects we do, right? That uh, when you can grab heat from a source, you can have more efficient uh, heat pumps. So, for example, you can move away from air source heat pumps to, let's say, water-to-water -water heat pumps, which are obviously much, much more efficient, both from a cooling and heating point of view, and that reduces the payback of projects. So, it's certainly happening, but uh, it, we need to, all of us, work together to accelerate it, right? Yeah, for sure. Mm. It, you know, it comes down mm. to kind of, yeah, knowledge mm. of mm. the policy, for sure, and the incentives around it. Enrique, are you seeing... What are the dominant types of heat pumps you're seeing play out across Europe? So, you know, Europe kind of is known as the hydronic heating systems. Is it air to water? Is it water to water? Or do you ever see a move to air to air or, or yeah, air based systems? I think it's uh, many types. So I, I, I would like the ones we sell to dominate, but I think, I think it's, a, it's very important to understand, as I said before, is there is not one solution that fits for all. So I, and I think in, in Panasonic opinion, it shouldn't be the, the debate which, which system is the, the one dominating. I think what we need to try to do is to integrate all the systems. So in fact, for us, uh, an important point is how to moving to this uh, digitalization, moving to this uh, uh, high, higher standard of, of control, how to be able to manage. Uh, a group. Uh, for instance, uh, in, in our case, we have already uh, more than 100,000 heat pumps connected. But in reality, we are not doing much of that. So how we could move to, to the next level in that sense, how we could benefit. In fact, we are not benefiting of that. And I'm not talking about one company. I'm talking uh, uh, in general, the society, how can we benefit out of that? And in fact, uh, this is what we are also thinking. So the people, as I think you said, the people don't understand well what is, what is that about, but how we can make the things easier. So, and, and also how we can create a frame where uh, it does not matter if you have manufacturer A, B, C, or D, how you can have an easy system. I, I would say I'm talking about standards, communication standards, where you can bring the total system into a, a way that could be managed as one set and then come to the social responsibility, improvement of, uh, of all the system as a total. Yeah. Could just to pick up on that, Jose, I'd like to bring you back in for, you know, we hear a lot about heat as a service. I'm sure you know, many of you in the crowd have heard about you know, as a service business models being you know, more and more um, important. You know, one of my colleagues often refers to it as you know, like how do we Netflix heating? 
is it is it something you're seeing on the horizon? You know, is this something that we should mm -hmm. take seriously? I think it was branded at one point as comfort as a service. I'm not sure I 100% love that, but um, yeah, <laughs> that's. Uh, I, I'm very glad you asked that question. For me, this is the the whole concept of the rental markets and and circular economy. And I'll, I think the best way to answer that question is to give you an example of something we've done recently. And and it's, so we, we have a customer who is a very large, uh, let's say, microchip manufacturer, and they, they built a new factory in, in one of the European countries, and we supplied the, the, you know, it was like 100 megawatts of cooling for this uh, plant to make microchips. Microchips are a big thing now. And uh, the process of making microchips also requires a lot of heating because you need to have humidity control and things like that, and usually, you know, we've sold machines that will do, that recover the heat. But there, you know, when the process is in balance, you can use those machines. But a lot of the time, the process is out of balance, meaning that they need to generate some heat because they, they cannot recover the heat from the cooling. So usually, this kind of, and these are this is a sophisticated company, a big company, I don't want to name it, but it's a big company. What their process was, was that when they built a factory, they would also purchase a lot of, uh, boilers, right? And these boilers were used maybe two, three months of the year to manage this uh, period of uh, where they don't have enough heat coming from the cooling process. So what we said to them, since we had the good relationship with them and, and they understand that we, are, that we know what we're talking about, we said, instead of buying these boilers, why don't you rent some commercial, you know, some large, you know, it's 14 megawatts of heat pumps and they're air source heat pumps when you need them. You call us, we bring them to you on 14 trucks, you connect it to your system, it's going to do the same thing as the, the fossil fuel uh, burning. So initially they were a little bit skeptical about it, but we showed them everything and they did it. And it's incredible how much money they have saved. And so they saved millions of liters of diesel oil because these uh, boilers were running on diesel oil. And, uh, and, they're very, and they saved the, the environment, they saved the money, and every year now they're renting. So that is an example of Eden as a service, but you have to go out there and see where these imbalances are, and then wherever there's an imbalance, it's an opportunity to sell heating as a service or cooling as a service. And the great thing is that when you do that, you help that customer, but that equipment can be used by somebody else, which leads into this idea of the sharing economy and all these things. So it's, it's definitely a, a lot of potential, and our rental business is a, a big part of our company as well. Okay, interesting. Yeah, we've seen the rental model plays out right for businesses that want you know, off balance sheet financing, if they don't want to have to write down assets, you know, their debt ratios might not be great. Um, so it's definitely an opportunity for that. We've seen there's a company in um, the US, Dandelion, I'm sure you guys are aware, but they do residential heat pumps as a service. Um, a really interesting company as kind of a spin out from uh, Alphabet. So um, yeah, they've been one to watch. They actually do ground source, which intriguing for me. I'm, I'm not entirely sure how easy it is to take it back if someone defaults, but um, They've assured me it works for the moment. Um, Carlos, I'd like to bring you in on that. How does policy keep up with this if we're, you know, if we're trying to experiment with you know, business models or different ways of, of heating? Is, is policy flexible enough? Do you think it's flexible enough to both encourage low carbon and also allow this? EU likes, EU likes to, to get into, get into everything, everything that's, that's new, dynamic, new dynamic, and, uh, and uh, of course we have an innovation policy, 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 notably through, through the Horizon, Horizon Europe Light, Light, Light programs. programs. I don't think, I don't we, think have we have quite, quite the program, program called, called uh, uh, Flix Energy, energy or, the or the lights just, just yet. Just yet. Um, that's, because um, that's because policy, policy cannot run ahead of life. I mean, if you imagine a river, then you first need the source of water before you start escaping the shores and building a nice canal. This means that the broader scale, policy scale, must, allow must allow for markets, for markets, to, markets develop. to develop, so by so no means should, should policy, policy be an obstacle uh, towards, towards the, the desirable, desirable developments. developments. Um, um, and, and this, this is, is why, fundamentally, fundamentally uh, things, things are technology are neutral. 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 Um, um, citizens, citizens come, come at, the at the core of the public, of the public policy, policy uh, and, and this is, this is what, what the, the, I would turn I would it around, around and say it's public, public policy, policy as a service. As a service. And, and, and this and is this called is democracy, democracy, basically. basically. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so there, there is, is no, compromise no compromise that can be made on, made on consumer, consumer protection. protection. And, and these, these considerations, considerations also, also uh, uh, dictate the pace at which policy goes. So what remains is the policy uh, for 
what remains is the possibility for companies to conquer new territory and offer new user experiences. And it's really about quality management and building trust in these new things. Um, because, I mean, not only your own car is a bit, you know, scary once you realize that you can also take the train and use uh, ride hailing services. So um, it's about developing a sort of uh, confidence uh, in, in a new in way, a of, new way life. of life and, and the fact that, fact that if you, you trust, trust the system, system it's going to pay off. Pay off. Like if, like you, if trust you trust the energy manager, manager uh, to make the, to right, make the right choices, choices for, you, for you, to install the right the type of right heater, heater, to, to uh, run it at the, the temperatures, temperatures uh, at the times where it's where most, most optimal, optimal. You, might you might end up making money out of it. And at the same time, you help the system and reduce the system running costs. So, so this is the this sort, is the of, sort thinking of thinking that we that should we get, should more, get more, uh, predominant. more predominant. The question, the question there, is, there is, of course, access to data, data and also the willingness, the willingness of, uh, companies of companies to pick it up, pick it up and, and uh, develop, develop a new strand that might be, be uh, let's say, let's resource say, intensive, intensive in, in the start, in the start but could but pay off in the long run. run. Yeah, precisely. So I, I know we're getting kind of late in the afternoon. I'm sure, you know, people are kind of starting to flag after a delicious lunch. So what I want to do is I want to ask one quick fire question to the panelists. And then we have about 10 minutes for audience Q&A. I know that there was no takers last time. So this is your warning. Um, if you'd like to ask a question, I feel like just standing up might also wake people up as well. But before we do that, just a quick fire round, starting with you, Enrique. If you could do one thing that would have the biggest impact in the next five years, in two words, no, I'm just kidding. Um, biggest impact in the next five years, what are we, what are we doing? Uh, a strong digitalization of society, enhance the electrification, and even more important, explain that to the consumers. So digital electrification, tell people what they should do. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, Jose? Yeah, I think the, the thing we have to do is continue to break these sort of energy silos within the economy, right? Like if you think about electric mobility or electrical storage, electrical power production, cooling, heating, they've all developed in silos for technological reasons over the last hundred or so years. I think today with uh, the technologies around digitalization, all of these things can be interconnected and when you connect them all, you end up, with a much, you end up in a much more efficient place. So obviously I'm working very hard with our business to break the cooling and heating uh, silo, but cooling and heating silo broken with, you know, if I think electric vehicles and, and batteries, that's like a, a place where you can really break the silo on storage. You can think about then thermal storage and the whole thing can be one ecosystem which could be thousands of percents more efficient and this is what we should all drive to do. Cool. Let's all work together. Mm. Not quite quick fire, but we'll <laughs> let you off. Carlos, last one. Well, I completely, well, I completely echo, echo what Jose, Jose said, Jose said because, because basically, basically uh, uh, it's, about it's about the end user, user experience, experience and about making smart decisions in that. So. Absolutely, for uh, breaking silos, uh, not just in heating and cooling, but really across yeah, sectors. sectors. Um, um, if we speak about mobility, if we speak about how people trade, trade interact, interact do their, uh, their uh, shopping on the weekends. On weekends. So when, so we, when speak we speak about decarbonization specifically, specifically, the power, the power actually, actually is with the people. With the people. Yeah, exactly. I agree. It's, yeah, we all need to move together. And I think heating for a long time has sat in the too hard basket and net zero doesn't let it sit there anymore. I still remember when, you know, some of the targets were, you know, 80% and everyone was like, oh, it's okay, we're in the 20% <laughs> and every sector was in the 20%. So, you know, obviously the, the math doesn't quite work out. So, I mean, the stress is now on Thomas if no one's willing to ask a question, but I would like to um, open it up to the floor. Is there any takers? I think there will be a mic that will be run to you if you are willing. I promise we don't bite. Yes, we've already got one taker. I'm like, sorry to that. Oh, yeah, perfect. There is a microphone. I'm like promising things on stage and just hoping oh, that it works. So um, here we go. If you could introduce yourself first, that would be great. Thank you. Hello. My name is Dominique, and I'm the icebreaker. So I have a quick question, not for anyone. Maybe for the person who's joining us virtually. We like to talk about Europe as the leader in climate and sustainability. What do you feel is the main lesson that Europe can teach the rest of the world? 
Carlos, I don't know if you caught that, but it was aimed at you. What, so Europe is kind of pitched as the leader, yet what can we teach everyone else? Yeah, I got yeah, that. I got Thanks, that. Very, Thanks much. very much. The thing that, the thing Europe, that Europe can teach is, is how to how bring, bring different, different sectors, sectors people, stakeholders, stakeholders together, together in a peaceful and organized manner. manner. I think that I think the that urgency, urgency of climate, climate change, change is, obvious is obvious to some, to some more than some others. Than others. Uh, uh, the pace at which modernizations happen might differ from member state to member state. Well, well. One of the uh, undesired, undesired consequences of this would this be that it, that it risks, risks uh, breaking up the market one way or, one the, way other. or the other. So, so if, if we want, we want to, to make sure, sure that, that the tensions, tensions are eased between the, the different strata uh, of society, uh, uh, companies, uh, uh, geographical areas, areas. Basically, basically, to keep, to keep the, the continent, continent or subcontinent uh, stable, stable, then, then this, this is where Europe comes in. And I think we're really good at doing this. Awesome. I mean, this is currently a panel with an Australian and a Kiwi, so I'm not sure we're like super qualified for Europe questions, but um, do, do either of you have anything to add on that? No, no, I, I, agree, with, I agree with Carl. So in fact, uh, as I said before, there are many, many speeds uh, in the market. So I think what we need to, what we need to work as in, in every sense from legislation as well from organizations, companies, we need to try to bring those markets up and yeah, so make a make the way that we can make the most consistent approach in Europe. Yeah. Awesome, Jose, you have lived yeah, here long enough. I think uh, <laughs> what we can teach, you know, at least I, I always go back to examples within my own company. Right? I think what we can teach our own other parts of the world is that these changes. It's a win-win. It's not something that by changing, it's going to cost you more. Actually, by changing, it's going to cost you less. And I think uh, when people start to understand that, it's going to move very fast. And Because usually when you do something better, it, co you know, the, it always costs more. But this is a time when it actually is cost less. I think, I mean, mm. I always find this one an interesting one, right? Because if we do the kind of traditional marginal abatement cost curve, you see energy efficiency is just, you know, a no-brainer. It's a win-win-win, and yet it is so hard to incentivize. <laughs> and so, you know, I think obviously for heating technologies, the equation is getting better, but I do kind of have almost a pushback a little bit where sometimes you can, you know, improve the economics and you will be better off in the long run, but that still doesn't make it so easy. <laughs> and I'm sure this crowd knows that, right? Um, do we have any other questions? Oh no, we had one brave person, and now. You've got 10 seconds, otherwise Thomas, I think, swoops in. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. So we make it five. I will not ask another question. I think this was a very interesting session, and as I said, we don't have the cities here yet, but you provided the, um, the solution perspective and at the conference in Vienna, we will have the city's the problem owner's perspective. So thank you very much yeah. for moderation and input provision. Also, Carlos, Carlos, you will get your tree. It will grow anyways without us handing over the certificate, but there is a tree for everybody. So Emma, thank you very okay. much for, for the moderation. Also, thank you so much. Hopefully it offsets my Eurostar here. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you very much. much. Thank you, no, Thank you very much, guys. And yeah, well, I think we were just the pitch for the future Decarb of Cities conference. So if you want to hear a bit more, um, yeah, please feel free to yeah, come along. Yeah, and then we can also present your slides, Emma. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Apologies <laughs> for that. So you have a reason to come back. Thank you very much. Thank you very nice much, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.